to reach for distant shores by Danielle Ackley MacPhail. The answers to my dreams were brought to me by a flash storm, come up from the south off the sea, violent, sudden, unexpected. The winds rarely drove from that direction, but when they did, it was gloriously primal. I could feel them in the fine bones of my body, like the warning my whisker hair sent when something dangerous loomed close by. While my sisters and brothers dove down deep at the threat of the storm, I wended my way upward to peer from the lee of the rocks jutting from the slapping waves, my eyes trained on the water's surface and the skies, avidly watching for the signs that would come swift and sudden and much too late for any about on the surface to heed. In the distance, barely heard, the air rumbled warning of the tempest's approach. With vague interest, I noticed narrow, oblong bladders high up in the sky, floating like the jellies beneath the waves, right down to the tendrils dangling from their core. Tiny trailers of electric static crackled like an eel's warning across the bladder's skin before the energy was gone, dispersed on the quickening wind. Again, my bones shivered as the storm drew ever closer. This was the moment when down close to the water, the air felt too still. My eyes scanned the sea, drawn by vibrations on the surface. To my left, a large mass drifted by, like a rare leviathan risen from the depths in the dark hour to let the light of the unseen moon brush its skin. It was a made thing, a ship filled with man-things scurrying about at this first hint of the coming storm. As the vessel passed, Thunder rumbled faintly in the distance, popping closer and closer. The rapidly darkening clouds lit up, and sudden trails of lightning danced down from the sky, colliding with each other and the mass on the water, high up where thin, straight branches rose like webbed fingers to touch the air. I watched with eager eyes, my breath barely rippling the froth on the waves, my hands gripped tight to the moss-coated rocks as my fins were nibbled clean by the tiny fish living in the shoals, poised to escape beneath the depths when the heavens finally crashed down to whip the waves into a frenzy. I left my leaving long, clinging in place as the air charged and crackled and thunderclouds of a sudden boiled up on the horizon. With a gleeful laugh, I dove deep and fast just before the storm front blanketed the world above. None on the water or in air saw mercy from that tempest. I came up to the shallows when the worst passed, eager to see the evidence of the storm's might. With care, I darted from mast to mast just beneath the water. All I found was broken by the punch of the waves and wind bitten by the power of the lightning. Fragments of those odd conveyances rained down, caught and cradled a moment before being swallowed by the sea. I turned my attention to the masters of those vessels, the bodies I left for the currents to slurp down or batter upon the distant sands as they may. There was one I came across with warmth yet in his veins. I wrapped both arms around and drew him down with me. Beneath the runnels of blood and scraggled hair, there was something of his face that spoke of fear. He jerked and thrashed as the waves closed overhead, his odd split tail flailing uselessly against my single powerful one. I murmured reassurances in his ear, but he continued to struggle. Grimacing, I tightened my grip and swam more swiftly to gain us the sanctuary of my private grotto. I held an eager breath. Never had I had this chance before, to speak to one who made their home above the water, one who knew of the sky jellies. I held little, if any, doubt of communication between us. In my long life, I had traveled far and listened well. I was certain I could speak and understand every language the man thing spoke near the sea, which was to say all of them. I knew what I would ask him, the only thing I cared to ask him. How 
how do you reach the sky? It was my dearest dream to take my place up there, to gain those distant shores and swim the waters of the unseen moon. I dreamt of dancing with the lightning, of climbing its jagged bolts into the heavens. There were oceans there. I could not see them, but I could feel their call in the shivers down my scales and the tremors through my whisker hairs. I had no doubt those waters were there. After all, look how much spray rained down to mingle here below. The lightning climbed up into the sky. Those, like the one wrapped in my arms, rode the winds. Perhaps the air jellies were the key to gaining the clouds. This one held the secret. He would give it up. My eggs had scoffed, but I would not rest until I was as cradled by those waters above as I was by my own sea. And here was my chance to discover the secret to making this so. But my effort was for naught. By the time we shook off the waters clinging, and I drew the stranger from above upon my own hidden sands deep below, the warmth had fled him. I stared at his peculiar face, and my teeth gnashed, jagged edge against jagged edge. I traced the plump curve of his now blue lips, and peered into strange, near-flat eyes, gone bloodshot and lifeless, as if my answers were written there. They were not. But something did glitter slightly lower. I reached out, pushed aside the odd flaps that covered his chest, like a skin torn loose and let flop to either side. Beneath was a wonder. It was an object like lightning-struck sand, only smooth and straight and clear. Something encapsulated within glowed faintly. I lifted the thing away, breaking the thin strap it hung from around the dead one's neck. And none too soon. A splash behind me betrayed an intrusion. Your bottom feeder tendencies are showing, my dear. Thin. Like a case of scale rot. That one had plagued me ever since we were fingerlings. Even in the egg sat he had been rotten, I was sure. Some day, when I spawned my young, I would eat any egg that held darkness such as his. For Finn had one goal. By word and deed, inflict what harm he may, and often. His disdainful tone sent my lips into a snarl, as if I would feed upon a thinking being. Before he spied it, I slipped my prize into the kelp bands I'd strung about my waist for carrying such things as I did not wish to hold in my hands. I then turned and glared at where he lounged, flukes in the water, arms on the sand, bracing him up. As ever, his eyes were mocking. He could not have noticed my expression. Not when he was too busy staring up and down the length of me, eyes lingering in the region of my pelvic fins. Hissing with annoyance and distaste, I heaved the strange one to my shoulder. With a wiggle of my fins and tail, I shoved past my egg brother. We were sheltered in the same nest, though not spawned from the same source. Before sliding into the water, hauling the corpse to the grotto's entrance, where I let the eager current reclaim its prize. Unburdened but still weighed down, I undulated upward. The surface was choppy yet, dotted with flotsam not claimed by the depths, but the clouds had vanished as quickly as they'd come, leaving the sky deep and dark and finely speckled like a dolphin. I let my head fall back, eyes closed, and breathed deep of the cleansing ozone-scented air, savoring the lingering taste of salt water tinged with freshly churned kelp on my lips. Slowly my muscles unbunched, my eyes opened to scan the sky. To the left, high up, I spied a patch seemingly void of stars. A dark cloud, one of the sky jellies, I could not say 
but without a doubt I could dream. With a few powerful strokes of my tail, I swam again toward the rocks, hauled myself up, and let the moonbeams caress my skin and scales. I looked up to the larger moon, the one all could see. Its touch was cool, soft, pleasant, but nothing more. The other, the hidden moon, I glowed with the charge it imbued. Warmth bathed me on the inside, despite the chill of the night. Someday, someday I would gain that vaunted moon's shores and swim its vibrant seas, forcing my gaze down and away, lest I remain mesmerized for longer than was safe. I looked to the object tucked within my kelp bands. My hand trembled as I drew it out with care. It was fine, more delicate than I would have thought possible. I could imagine neither its purpose nor manner of creation. I had taken it because it caught my eye. I kept it, for it seemed a treasure, something of value to the lost soul I had claimed it from. Perhaps it would serve a purpose for me, as lore or boon to one from his world who might aid me. I secured it once more, not wanting the jealous waves to claim my prize. That was when I heard it, a broken sound, a weak one. It was foreign even to me, who had ventured forth through all the earthly seas available to me, which was to say, all of them. I was a powerful swimmer. My dorsal fronds stiffened not quite billowing as they would beneath the waves, but nonetheless they snapped at the air in eager anticipation. This was a new thing. I angled my head to capture the sound, to pinpoint the source. It had something of a seal's bark, were the seal half dead, and something of the seagull's call, only much less demanding. I could not for a moment imagine what made such a sound. Taught with the need to know, I drew myself across the rocks, up through the crevice that split this oceanic outcrop. I was silent as I moved, the muscles in my tail bunching to push against the rock, aiding my arms as they may. As I drew closer to the sound, I slowed my motions. A tall, thin spire of rock jutted high overhead. With care, I placed my webbed fingers against its jagged mass and pulled myself up to peer around the bulk of it. The water glittered in the moonlight, as it could not hope to beneath the sun, else I would not have noticed an odd form clinging to the base of the outcrop, half in and half out of the waves, broke up that liquid shimmer. It humped first large, then smaller, holding to the rocks as tight as a barnacle did. There was the odd glimmer as the moon stroked something wet and sleek, but only in patches, as if the form were not all of one thing. I almost lost my grip and tumbled down as suddenly a different, higher wail rose, piercing my delicate ears clear through. And then I saw the one form was two small huddled against the large. My pelvic fins fluttered instinctually. I watched as the bigger of the two pulled the other close to shelter against her. For her it was. I could see as the moon now caressed the paleness of her face. The little one looked up, and a sound escaped me. It was a boy thing, small lips full and flat eyes familiar though lacking the tinge of blood red last seen upon the eyes of another face. Were the sea kinder, I could see this one might grow into the man-thing I'd gripped in my arms not long ago. Perhaps it was my earlier thoughts of spawning, but an ache settled in my chest to see the young one at the mercy of the sea. I leaned closer, my head tilted for a better view, my ear hole bent toward them to pick up the words drifting on the night's breeze. He said he would find us. He promised if anything happened to the ship. 
the woman thing murmured through cracked lips. Her words drifted, broken, and as faint as the sounds she'd first made. Find a place of safety, he said, and signal him. He will come, he promised. But the flare, it's gone. Her one hand rose briefly to touch an object around her neck. From a familiar strap hung the fragments of what seemed the cousin to the object hidden in my kelp bands. As the woman thing slid deeper in the water, she scrambled to cling to the rocks once more. More of the tortured sounds, point and counterpoint, high voice and low. Though the sounds hurt my ears, I remained perched in my crevice, oddly captivated by the scene below. As I stayed there, the night air brushed over my form, gentle but persistent, until my skin and scales itched and twitched and tightened enough to bring me to wailing myself. The depths called to me, soothing and wet, cool and dark, and yet I watched until I spied the boy thing slide into the grip of the waves. The woman thing cried out and dove fearlessly after, in several long moments surfacing with her sputtering young. He choked and gasped as I have never heard a creature come from the sea. Great racking coughs spewed water upon the rocks. My gaze went to his neck. I gasped myself and my gills twitched in empathy when realization dawned. As the fish remain ever below, these man-things thrive only above. My mouth gaped with remorse as my eyes opened to what I had done in drawing the man-thing down beneath the waves. I had borne no malice, yet like Finn I'd wreaked great harm. Even could I wrest the man-thing from the sea, the deed could not be undone. He would not breathe again nor return to these steadfastly waiting. But there was one thing I could do in restitution. My numb fingers slid down to grip the rod still lodged within my now dry kelp bands. It had clearly held in port for him, kept as it was hidden against his breast. I suspect this was another of the flares the woman thing worried over. I knew what I must do. Sliding back down the outcrop, harsh rocks scraping free dried scales as I went, I slipped with a grateful sigh back into the sea. Powerful twitches of my tail sent me around the rocks to where the two I'd watched still clung. From this new vantage point, I saw they perched because they could not climb higher against the algae-coated rock. This I could fix. The night air splintered with their shrieks, as I braced against their bottoms, first the boy thing, then the woman thing, and with powerful thrusts of my tail, surged forward, propelling them from the sea and up onto the rocks. They scrambled higher, clutching each other in as tight a grip as I'd held their man thing when I drew him under the sea. I bobbed there where they had clung, merely watching, bemused but content that the waters would not have them. I met the gaze of the woman thing, remorse in my eyes, though my tongue remained silent. I had not the words to make my deed right, none to excuse them. I bowed my head down as I slid my hands into the kelp man, working the object free. It glowed in the moonlight as I brought it forth and the terror in the woman thing's expression lightened with a gleam of hope. Like a crab, she sidled toward my outstretched hand, snatching my prize and scurrying back. Without a word, I turned away and dropped beneath the waves, but not before I glanced a fleeting moment up into the sky. Some day I would dance with the lightning and climb its jagged bolts into the heavens. Some day I would reach those distant shores to swim the seas of the unseen moon, but not today.